claims are very much lagging. And it's, this is one thing that we talk about in Scott's program all the time is the last thing to go up is unemployment. That was clearly what happened in some of the past recessions, certainly in the 80s. And so the un unemployment can stick low for months before the, even after the recession starts. So on, claims are very much lagging. What's really kicked in today, as you pointed out, Philly Fed, existing home sales. That number for existing home sales, the trajectory, the downward trajectory is as bad as 2008. And the Fed started tightening in 2007 based on data like this, based on widespread. Wow. It's exist, it's home sales. So that is the essence of the entire economy. And when people aren't, obviously, it's completely locked up. And you can't buy, you can't sell. And since when is that good? I mean, people aren't going to Home Depot. They're not. And the thing is, existing homes, uh, new home sales are the highest ever, but that's also a very sign, sign of a peak. The Federal Reserve, in its recent announcement, chose to maintain its current stance on interest rates. However, according to the central bank's projections released on Wednesday, it anticipates raising interest rates once more within this year. These projections indicate that the central bank plans to increase rates to approximately 5.6% by the end of 2023 up from the current range of 5.25% to 5.5%. During the meeting, 12 Fed officials supported this additional rate hike, while 7 opposed it. With two more policy meetings remaining in the year, the rate-setting Federal Open Market Committee has projected two rate cuts for 2024, which is a reduction from the forecast made in June. This adjustment is driven more by Fed officials' optimism about economic growth than concerns about persistent inflation, as emphasized by Fed Chair Jerome Powell during a press conference. In a related discussion, Mike McGlone shares his insights on Powell's speech and his predictions regarding the future of the economy. He also provides his perspective on Bitcoin and how the asset class might be affected in the event of a stock market downturn. I enjoy those narratives, and it's so important that we have discourse and we have politicians we hate, politicians we love, and we have disagreements. There's so many places in the world you can't do that, and that's the places that are really falling behind, number one, China. But here's a key thing that when it comes to Fed, that all that matters. This is a screen from Bloomberg. It just shows the Fed's going to, you know, next meeting is November, and there's 29% they're going to uh, hike. Um, they're not going to hike. I don't think so, but my view, that's where it is, 29%. And they, the rate peaks around 5.46 in January. And then that's what you see now. The market expects rates to start declining. Now, this to me is not going to happen unless the stock market makes it, um, partly because inflation's too high. So to me, that's where it's going with the Fed. The Fed, I felt, was completely expected, straightforward. I think Mr. Powell is going to go down in history as part of orchestrating one of the biggest resets in lifetime and not so much his fault just by virtue of where he is in history he had to cut a lot he cut way too much and then created way too much liquidity and then he took it away too fast and that's what i kind of showed in that other chart before so to me this is the bottom line it's the market this is what the market's priced for when so i'd enjoy when people say oh they're gonna hike or they're gonna cut it's just like hey well just tell me here's what the market's already in it's sort of the betting the professional betters already doing and you you know you do that with trading but to me, it's just, um, it, it's, it's, it's so broadcast now. It's so factual that you don't want to fight the Fed. And the bottom line is these bump, bumps right here. They still have their finger on the tightening button. And what you're seeing today is not even leaving that one bit. We still are priced at this 546 level. That's what I, my point is. You've got to take that stock market down for one bridge at a time. The first take the tightening out of the system, still priced in, and then next to start going for easing. And to me, that easing period is after we start easing, if you look in history, maybe the stock market the drops. Yeah, I can, yeah, after you start easing, it stop, it, I, I'll, show, I'll pull that one up a second. Maybe yeah. it, it, it bottoms about two years afterwards. That's how early we are. And that's why I made, I showed, I had a show early on how expensive we are. And that's the point is most people have traded cryptos. Cryptos came of age during a zero interest rate policy, have not realized that we've just been born and raised in a very much historical anomaly. Now, I was became a teenager in the 70s during inflation. It was kind of just normal for me. But when you grow up and you see Lehman collapse and then you see zero interest rates and you start trading 10 years ago, you think that's normal. It's just, in your, it's not. And that's what Jerome Powell's deal is shifting back. And that's where the macro kicks in. And it's just getting started. It's start, so here's a simple thing I can show you a little bit is on the S&P 500. It was right before COVID around 3,000. There's all the reason in the world it should go back to that level. And there's it's not a lot to say. It's not profound because it's what it always does in recessions. Our models at 100% for recession. It was right here. It was bumping up against, it was running around 3,000 and it was a kind of key level. 
And there's very little reason for it not to go there. Now, we've had this bounce, but it's exactly what happened in 1930. The market bottomed. It, it dropped 50%. It rallied 50%. Everybody thought it was over and then went back down. I think this is happening. The key difference is we didn't have a war then. We had didn't have anywhere near the massive pump and liquidity that's dumping. And the Fed already started easing in, uh, in 1929. They're still tightening. The Bitcoin price continues to retrace its steps from January 2022, hinting at a significant correction in the broader context. If the critical support level of $25,229 breaks down, it will serve as confirmation and trigger a bearish outlook for Bitcoin. In the absence of a reduction in bearish pressure by the bulls, the pioneering cryptocurrency may revisit the $20,431 support level. On the flip side, a bullish scenario could emerge if Bitcoin successfully transforms the psychological level of $30,000 into a support. Mike McGlone provides an in-depth analysis of these developments, though he maintains a more bearish stance than a bullish one. I would look at Bitcoin as a macro money manager, and this is something I printed recently. I had to put this out. It's the most significant leading indicator in the history of mankind, bar none. And anybody wants to dispute that one with me, I'm sure I'll find it. Well, which one's trading? You know, I'd love to debate it, but it's, um, and it, the key thing is it's a 60, 70 vol asset. And I remember during 2000, that was really long gold and bonds and everything. I still lost 30% of my gold positions when they initially you know, everything hit the fan. And that's a 16 vol asset. So the best performing asset in history that came of age during a zero interest rate policy that's completely reversed, that still trades with the 60 vol, it's just logical to expect when the shit hits the fan, people hit their stop buttons, hit the stops, and the margin calls kick in, that asset is going to go down, if I'm right. And that's what I pointed out here. It's already started. So you look at the 20-week moving average, it's already started rolling over. This is just from like a week ago. I had to point that out. Bitcoin is already starting that process. Um, it's already started rolling over. Now, it's not perfect, but the bottom line is this uh, This chart's going to take a little second. I'm kicking on it. But the number one thing that I watch in every day in all markets is, is li the liquidity from – it's already off the charts. This, this is right here. And what I show you here is Fed Fund Futures. This is a 13th Fed Fund Futures. So that basically is it's a price indication of what to expect from the Fed in a year. It's the hopium of liquidity. There is no hope for risk assets to go up by the rules of economics and liquidity until at first thing it has to start going up is the market has to start seeing liquidity from here, meaning this number has to start going up. That's why I look at this every single day. One of the first things I look at is FFA, commodity CT, and we'll just see what's the, what's the Fed doing. What do we expect from the Fed? These numbers here, okay, they're, they, the, the yields are dropping a little bit, but you got to really see these numbers start dropping, just especially a year from now, which is right here, September, October, 5%. That's, that number's got to really drop to see, see the liquidity. And for that to happen, the stock market has to go down. It's a lose-lose because it's the rules of overvalued assets. They hardly ever go up until the market can, at least, market can at least see the whites of the eyes of liquidity coming. And that's, as Scott, you, I think I could agree with you, it's just somewhat intentional from the Fed. They want to break that umbilical cord of every time right. the stock market goes down 20% um, that the, they ease. And they, I, I'll show you a chart in that a little bit. That's just something that's, that's over, that's changed. Russia has implemented a temporary ban on the export of gasoline and diesel to all countries outside a specific group of four former Soviet states, effective immediately. The primary objective of this move is to stabilize the domestic market, as announced by the government on Thursday. The ban excludes fuels supplied under intergovernmental agreements to members of the Moscow-led Eurasian Economic Union, which comprises Belarus, Kazakhstan, Armenia, and Kyrgyzstan. These temporary restrictions are aimed at bolstering the fuel market, ultimately leading to reduced prices for consumers according to a government statement. The energy ministry explained that this measure is designed to prevent unauthorized, unregulated exports of motor fuels. The ban is open-ended, with future actions contingent upon market saturation. Russian First Deputy Energy Minister Pavel Surikin commented, We expect that the market will feel the effect quickly enough, but then it will depend on the saturation of the market and the results. In recent months, Russia has faced gasoline and diesel shortages, resulting in a surge in wholesale fuel prices, even though retail prices are capped to align with official inflation rates. These shortages have been particularly impactful in certain regions of Russia, especially those crucial for agricultural harvests that heavily rely on fuel. The Kremlin faces the challenge of managing this crisis, especially with a presidential election looming in March. Traders attribute the fuel market challenges to factors such as maintenance at oil refineries, transportation bottlenecks on railways, and the weakening ruble, 
which incentivizes fuel exports. Russia has already reduced its seaborne diesel and gas oil exports by nearly 30% in the first 20 days of September compared to the same period in August, based on data from traders and ICG. Projections for the economic outlook appear highly pessimistic, with concerns about the possibility of the most significant recession in recent memory. Your opinions on this situation are welcome, please share them below. For more Daily Dose Crypto News, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.